Thank you for listening to Scandinavian Crimes Podcast. Be sure to check out the episode links and be part of our other social media platforms where you can leave a topic suggestion or even share some of your insights regarding the subject matter of the episode. We will always do our best to provide a well-researched episode, but sometimes due to limited access to information and translation issues, some information can be lost. It is therefore good to do your own research and get a deeper understanding of a case of your own interest. So with that all said, let us start today's episode. Welcome to another episode of Scandinavian Crimes. My name is Devante, and say hello to my lovely co-host, Delilah. Hi. And on this podcast, we will cover famous Scandinavian criminals who made their mark throughout Scandinavian history. So today's episode is very, very, very interesting. It's an unsolved crime, actually. Uh, We will tell the story of this woman who was found dead in a luxury hotel in oslo norway she was seen with a gun in her hand and a gunshot wound to her forehead so you would think it sounds like a regular suicide right well experts in the area think very differently and some opinions actually vary from person to person regarding the event there's some strange evidence that contradicts the death to be a suicide and it seems more like a cover-up rather than a murder So I hope you're ready with some of your favorite snacks, your favorite tea, your favorite coffee, all that jazz. Because today, here's the story of the death of the Oslo Plaza woman. On a Wednesday evening in May 31st, 1995, a young woman registered at the Oslo Plaza Hotel, which is considered to be a five-star luxury hotel. She was with a man during the registration. He shortly left after she was given the room 2805 to stay in. There was a don't disturb sign in front of the door for two days, which made it hard for the hotel staff to reach her. Therefore, on the third day, a security guard was sent to her. He knocked on the room 2805 after the hotel staff repeatedly tried to reach the woman regarding her payment. The security guard all of a sudden heard a loud sound like a gunshot. The guard waited outside a little bit before he went to get reinforcements rather than using a two-way radio to broadcast his suspicion. The door was unguarded for 15 minutes before the head of security arrived and opened the door to discover the woman's dead body. During the investigation, it was likely determined that she had committed suicide. What makes the case very different is the evidence seems to have contradicted the idea in which suicide had taken place. Most of the interrogation came from the hotel staff and reports of a few security guards that were involved. When the woman arrived with the man on May 31st, they somehow were able to register without providing any credit card information. This was very strange due to the hotel's good reputation for having high security and good protocols for identification and payment handling. However, when she did register with the hotel, there was some form of information regarding her name, as well as the man's name and address, and phone numbers, as well as birth date. She was registered as Jennifer Fairgate, but signed her name twice as Jennifer Fergate. The man, however, was registered as Louis Fairgate, who shortly left after Jennifer received her room, never to be seen again. We will use her registered name, Jennifer, throughout the story, so that way it's just a little bit easier to follow. Three days later, after 7.30 p.m., a receptionist named Evie Tudum Jertsen noticed something was wrong with the occupants in room 2805. The room was one of the best rooms, costing around $330 per night. When the head of security arrived to the crime scene, he saw Jennifer on the bed dead. It smelled acrid, so he closed the door and called the police who arrived 50 minutes later. The police saw Jennifer with a gunshot wound on her head and holding a gun. The gun was a military weapon, a Hungarian copy from the 60s or 70s. There was no trace of anybody being in the room, nor that she struggled before her death. She was wearing a beautiful black dress and heels. Throughout her stay, there were few entries she made to the room, and there was no entry during her time of death. This made the police suspect her cause of death to be suicide, but with further investigation, the police found evidence that did not make sense to the idea of suicide. They could not find any identification of Jennifer, no wallet, no passport, no cosmetics, or even toiletries. Only top wear clothes were found and no bottom wear nor any labels on the clothes. They also found a briefcase with only cartridges of 25 rounds. Witnesses and hotel staff had other contradicting information. The cleaning staff arrived in an empty room on Thursday from 1 p.m. to 8.50 a.m. This means she was not in the hotel room for 20 hours. The hotel had security cameras, but the police didn't seem to have searched the footage according to the documents. 
An autopsy revealed that Jennifer had undigested food in her body. It was the same food that she ordered from room service 24 hours before her death on Friday, June 2nd at 8.06 p.m. On the next day, forensics unit noted that half of the meal had been eaten. A newspaper was found in the room as well with the number 2816 written on it. Back then, the hotel didn't have a guest list, so it was unclear who stayed in that room 2816. There seems to have been a Belgian man who stayed in the room across Jennifer shortly before her death. Upon being questioned about Jennifer, the man claims that he was informed about her death during his checkout on the morning of Saturday, June 3rd. The only problem with that statement is Jennifer died on the evening of June 3rd. The only identification they had of Jennifer was from her registration card, which stated that she was from Belgium. Her death was reported to Interpol Belgium, but they replied that Jennifer does not exist in their registry. The police used Jennifer's fingerprints from the crime scene to search throughout Interpol, but nothing was found. For the next couple weeks, it was considered a homicide investigation. However, because there was no new lead information to support this initial theory, suicide ended up being the cause of death. There was no missing persons report made for Jennifer, which made it even harder for the police to identify. Many publications of her in different countries in an effort to find her family and inform them of her death. The body was saved for a whole year until they decided to bury her with no name on June 26, 1996. They also discarded all the documents and evidence of the case. In the Netflix show Unsolved Mysteries, Lars Christensen Wegner made a trip to Belgium, relaying the town that Jennifer listed on her Oslo Plaza hotel registration. This was in an effort to find any clues or signs to identify Jennifer 24 years later. He acknowledged that Jennifer probably wasn't from the area, but she seemed to have had enough knowledge to pass off as a resident. His theory was that the information on the registration card could have come from some sort of importance in Jennifer's life. Even though the phone number and address were very similar to that area, her address does not exist in that neighborhood. Nobody seemed to recognize who she was either. In the present, all that's known about Oslo Plaza woman, aka Jennifer, she was presumably 24 years old at the time of her death, and she was most likely from East Germany. Experts in the field have many theories on what happened to Jennifer and who she truly was. By analyzing the evidence, experts think it is clear that this was not a suicide, but something far more sinister. A retired crime scene investigator describes the gun as an assault weapon and states that it could have been most likely dropped from her hand due to the hard recoil, especially with Jennifer's weak hand grip. She held the gun with her thumb on the trigger and the fingers on the other side of the handle, which would guarantee her losing the grip after one shot. Usually in most suicide, one holds the gun with both hands, which would give some sort of blood stains on the hands and clothes in the gun's barrel after the shot. However, Jennifer didn't have any blood on her anywhere else on the crime scene, only on her wound. This serves as further evidence the body had been staged. Norwegian intelligence operative Ola Kardager believes that Jennifer was a secret agent. The Plaza Hotel was a modern five-star hotel with, where millionaires, international stars, and politicians stayed. The Plaza Hotel had a lot of political meetings, so it's not impossible she could have been on a mission involving that. One of the biggest mysteries during the investigation was her getting into the hotel and the country without any form of identification. It should have not been possible due to the hotel's high security and standards. Another weird thing is her weapon. The gun was a military weapon, which is common within the intelligence organization. Jennifer's fingerprints were not found on the gun, which strengthens the theory that someone killed her and wiped the gun. The art to manipulate a crime scene for it to look like a suicide is a typical professional operation. Overall, it seems like a good carried out intelligence operation where she got executed. Usually the government quietly notifies the death of the secret agents to their families. They will then be provided for for the rest of their lives as long as they are silent, which might be why nobody has reached out about her being missing. Another theory is that the 20 hour gap might imply that she could be affiliated with drugs or prostitution and that she got eliminated by an underground organization. It would also explain her not having any ties to a family. A theory by murder experts is that two gunshots were shot. The first shot was made during the night on June 2nd, and the second shot was a warning shot meant to alarm the security guard. It is assumed that the suspect left the room during the 15 minutes the security guard was absent. If the deceased was some type of secret agent, then the suspect could have been an assassin who killed her on June 2nd and stayed in a room through June 3rd to cover up the crime scene. The hotel employees and security guard did notice that acrid smell, which implies the body wasn't fresh, and could have also been from the cleanup. 
It is possible that Jennifer did indeed die on Friday, June 2nd, after partially eating her room service meal, which was seen in her autopsy. He claims that he was informed about the murder before it happened. What seems strange is that nothing seemed to be further investigated of the man, even though they found a newspaper in Jennifer's room marked with the same number of the Belgian man's room, number 2816. So as trippy and as crazy as that story is, that's is pretty much the story of the uh, Oslo Plaza woman. Now, uh, if I'm going to be completely honest, um, before we even got to that section of the story, I automatically assumed she was a secret agent. Honestly, this sounds like a cover up job. Um, most most um, people think that stuff does not happen. Espionage and um, the CIA and well, CIA is you know, obviously Central Intelligence Agency for the U.S., but every country has their own version of it. Uh, what was it? I think UK, what, MI6, MI5, whatever you call it. I'm like, though, that, that happens. Stuff like that happens for real. They're not just movies. They're not cool and flashy like they make them seem in the movies, but that stuff really happens internationally. So I actually thought that she probably was an agent because the cleanup job was too good for it to be some sort of drug situation. Most drug, you know, people, and um, no matter how like really large, it usually doesn't look that good. As long as the evidence doesn't lead them back to the person who killed them, they don't really care like that. This is a well cleanup up job. And the fact that it's unsolved, no one's come up. Uh, there's no evidence. It was a super clean, smooth getaway. I think this is some form of espionage that took place, especially due to the reputation of the hotel. I kind of have the theory, like first when I heard about this story, I was like, this is suicide. And that was just like only the summary. And then when all the details kind of unfolded, I was like, huh, this kind of sounds like she is not really, um, well, like, I wouldn't say trained in a way, but I would say that the one who might have murdered her could have had been associated with, like, some type of intelligence organization. Organization. The reason I say that is because she kind of spelled her name wrong in the beginning. Um, she also, even though she was, like, absent most of the time of the whole, you know, her whole visit, uh, and she rarely, like, l entered the room... Um, she kind of were gone a lot and in my brain I'm like maybe she was maybe she had some type of association with like prostitution um, cause there was no kind of info that somebody entered the room during the, her time of the like death but that someone entered before that like like hours late uh, before like on Friday uh and to me, that could be like she invited somebody in as a client or something. So, like, that's why I feel like she probably got executed by someone who is part, like, maybe an agent or, like, somebody who can clean up and do all that. Or maybe, and then she kind of, like, is part of some type of prostitution or, like, human trafficking or something. Because it would, to me, that would make more sense than her being a secret agent. However, the, uh, what's his name? The um, Keldener, I think it was, his name was, the the detective or the like he, the one who assumed that it was a secret intelligent operation. Uh, he kind of did say that, you know, oftentimes secret agents like go to different places and don't always stay in the one place in one hotel. And that could be the reason why she was like, either gone for a long period of time or that she was mostly inside the hotel and i mean like maybe but i think that the one that was a dead giveaway was that she couldn't spell her name right and i think a secret agent like should like spell their names right to be like accurate with everything so it doesn't hint something um but either way i i think this whole case or like this unsolved mystery was is very interesting there's a lot of components that is like contradicting and you don't really know who and what is like go what's going on and who is the culprit and anything i do think that the man who lived in the room in front of her uh i think like how can they not suspect him how could they not have done a thorough investigation on him 
And that kind of leads to the point where, like, the police didn't really do a good job. Uh, they just assumed it was a suicide, even though they had all these contradicting evidence. And they didn't question the Belgian man living across or in front of Jennifer's room. They didn't check any security footage that the hotel had. Whoa. And I feel like... Well, think of it like this as well. <clears throat> so I'll put it to you in these terms. Usually with a lot of espionage jobs, there's usually multiple layers of uh, kind of how things transpire. So I'm just giving a hypothetical. So let's say, which some people believe in the story, uh, obviously, let's say it is an espionage kind of situation. It's not just the spy or the person who got killed in a room or even the Belgian guy. I think he probably was definitely in on it to some level. Whether he oh, was, definitely. he could have been a, another agent or something. But let's say, you know, it's an espionage thing. It's not just the agent in the room. They also, I'm pretty sure they they uh kind of scoped out the hotel. They might have someone working internally as an employee who probably yeah, started I working so there too. months in advance, yeah. knowing that they had to uh, be there for that specific day. I'm pretty sure during the investigation, a lot of the higher ups were giving direction on not to investigate certain things or certain things were thrown out as evidence, maybe being inadmissible. There's, there's usually multiple layers to this because of how complex and how crazy some of these uh, missions can get for government related reasons. Yeah, like, cause I'm like, there's no way she was a prostitute or anything like it that could like, be, though, how, because how is there could, no she could have been how, there's no like, record there's no the record of her through like illegal like what's it called smuggling not smuggling but like how they transport people illegally but also her fingerprints never registered to anywhere i mean even that back could in happen the 90s as well. even back in the 90s when you were born your fingerprints are taken the day you're born there's records of you i'm honestly i honestly don't know actually how it was back in the day in Norway or in Sweden for that matter as well when it comes to like fingerprints and such but most I, I just it, thought I mean, that it, they it, did that because uh, uh, of like for like records. I didn't think they I didn't think they I, I think they only did it for like criminals because they didn't find you know, any fingerprints when, anywhere in anywhere when they searched yeah when you're like even a baby like your record your fingerprints don't change your entire life your fingerprints stay exactly the same. Yeah, I so get that, but like if, at least so, they should have found something then. Like, that's that's my point. The thing is, they sent her fingerprints to Interpol. Interpol exists in like pretty much every developed country, mm -hmm. and nothing comes back. Even if you got into a country through illegal means, that means you were stolen from somewhere else where you were supposed to be, which means you would have popped up. So are you but, saying Interpol also do for? like civil citizens and not only criminals I, what I'm saying is like Interpol has a registry of basically most people what I think was going on is that this isn't espionage because her information was white mm. like there's nothing leading back to her not an origin country people have to make assumptions off of like I said no fingerprints no nothing that means her records were white that's like redacted information that someone pulled their information from somewhere so that way she wouldn't pop up on anyone's radar because it was supposed to be a job that was supposed to take her out. She got mm. killed and they cleaned up the job. No one got called. It's an unsolved case. And then guess what? Life goes on. This was definitely, I, this is my opinion, of course. So y'all can think whatever y'all want out there in the world. But I think this was definitely a, a job that was specifically meant to take her out and there were multiple and levels in which, like basically. yeah, there, there was multiple levels in which things happened to make it seem like a suicide. So that way, no matter what, it would get closed. It would not get reopened later on in life. There wasn't enough evidence. I'm pretty sure that Belgium do probably has something to do with it. Um, He's part I'm pretty of sure it. someone working at the hotel, how her records got wiped, and I think even to some level, maybe the police were told indirectly from their higher ups what they could and couldn't investigate because there, it seems like they only investigated very specific things but not other to make it look things. and report it i think the police yeah. was part of it you know what i think they kind of had someone was like someone has some relations to the case for it to like just 
not be investigated properly. I feel like there's like some kind of involvement from the police or like one person within the police and then one who was in the hotel staff, one who was on the uh, like uh, airport or however they were able to get to the country um, and then the Belgian man who was in uh, like close to her room. So like I feel like there's some kind of teamwork going on for this to happen. I just find it strange that you know, she spelled her name wrong. That's the only thing that makes me like doubt her in that way. Uh, but the, everything else just, you know, makes sense to me. Uh, I mean, honestly. I think even the name thing makes sense. I don't think maybe she herself was a spy. You know, the cleanup, everything, like, everything just makes sense. Like, if you can't find any identification of a person, that's a red flag. Like, that is, like, okay. Because that's, you know, usually on most suicides, you find the identification of that person. And also the labels from the clothes being wiped uh, away. No, cause like, nothing. It's, like... And also that she had a dress looking like she was on her way out to go somewhere. It just, like, I find it very strange that the police was like, yeah, it's a suicide, even though it was, like, looked so clean and with no blood or any, like, I just, I don't know. I, it seems like they kind of knew and uh, they tried to, like, they had a team of people and were able to cover it up. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she was the target. I don't think she was necessarily a spy herself. She probably was involved in something, and she was the target. So that's what I think. Yeah, I think that as well, yeah. So, you know, it's... I also wanted to, like, like, uh, just a thing that I thought about is that the police said that, oh, in the key, on the key registry system, there was no one who like went into the room during her time of de- death and I was like but what if she let someone enter someone she was familiar with or someone who was a client or something and that's why the key card couldn't register that because she willingly let somebody into the room that's also why I think she was like it was kind of maybe a human trafficking or she was a prostitute um and I think that, you know, people have that in mind that the key register only registers someone get in with a card, not if someone lets somebody in or anything like that. So the theory of her dying the night before, like on Friday, would also make sense in that case, is what I believe. Um, but just some like general information about. Maybe you guys are thinking, why didn't they do any DNA testing? Like, it was, you know, around the 90s. And back then in Norway, at that time, you know, that technique, the DNA testing technique, wasn't really that common. And they did actually try to take some DNA and use today's technology to kind of identify Jennifer and they were able to just find out that she was like of European heritage and that was it. Um, There was like no matching DNA profile with her anywhere and they couldn't identify her even with DNA testing. If only they were able to like use this technique back then before they burned all the evidence, maybe they could have had an easier time identifying her. Or, you know, maybe if they actually went to like Belgium, for example, because it seemed like she had some relations relation with that, that village, for example, uh, instead of visiting it 24 years later, maybe they could have done that earlier to find some clues, you know, when every evidence and everything is fresh. Um, but unfortunately, you know, with time, evidence also kind of fade away and you lose connections and stuff well, as well. I will well. say this as well, uh-huh. is even with DNA evidence, if you have some sort of family member that's related to you, they would be able to find them. So the fact that even after they DNA tested years later, the fact that nothing popped up, that means her records were deleted. There's, someone got rid of her completely. She doesn't exist. 
officially. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like because it's years later. But, but even if they would but have even made then, it, that that that's, that's that wouldn't even be the situation. Let's say it was me and you for obviously, God forbid we live. A, you know, we live a very long <laughs> life. But let's say <laughs> hypothetically, in this situation, I were to get killed, then they mm. would be able to trace my DNA, at some point, and find who's related to me, which would lead them immediately to my father, my mother, my sister, my cousins, because you know we're related. But, and it doesn't matter how long it is, as long as they have DNA evidence of where they can still do it nowadays. That's how that's how ancestry tests work. They can find out where your that means they can find out who your family tree is. Okay, let me in that case say this. I know people who have been adopted, for example, and they're trying to find their biological parents. And they use ancestry. Right? They're having a hard time finding them because they'll use ancestry. You, the, most of the time, it's difficult is unless i heard that ancestry is, is like not working well, that I'm not well, say, all right, so let me clarify i don't mean be. like ancestry specifically but basically they have people who do that and i guess what i'm trying to say is in this and especially in this case interpol's involved and they have dna they will find someone who's related to you as long as you're on paper as long as you're an official person okay which, so basically even though they had the technique, they still didn't, couldn't find it until t- like which even means today. Someone went out their way to get rid of anything related old. to her, which includes her family, kin, mm. nothing. Which means she was a ghost legally. That's crazy, though. Imagine that. That's so crazy. Like, oh wow. So that's why it's a little trippy. I don't even know what to say. Like I. It's kind of hard to, like, as you said before, like, imagining that this actually happens without we, like, us knowing about the, you know, secret intelligent operations and stuff and secret agents. And you only see that in movies, but it's kind of like... It's real. Weird to... Yeah. It's it's interesting. And for us to be this close and, like, kind of close to something that could be a secret you know, intelligent operation is very, you know, interesting and learning for me, at, at least. Uh, I hope people don't get into these messy situations. <laughs> and, um, you know, hopefully this case was interesting to everybody. Uh, if you guys have like, like, what are your theories of the whole Jennifer case? Like, do you think, like, why was her... What was her cause of death? Who was she? Uh, because I think me and Devante kind of is on the realm of like she espionage. was either a it's vic- definitely yeah some, some kind of, of intelligent and, yeah, operation. Definitely. Yeah, but if you guys have any other like you know theories or something that you think or thought about during the whole listening to this uh, this episode, feel free to comment uh, your theories on our social media, and we will l- love to read all of that. Of course, and. Uh... What's some good food to end it on today? I am going to go for. Hmm, I've already said chicken and waffles. I already said oxtail. So that's some of the good stuff. But you know, I feel like we say the same. I don't though. Actually, time, change though. it up. Actually, uh, today. Because I have the same cravings today I'm every go time. Very much Dominican, <laughs> and I can definitely go for some. Mm. Uh, mango and some salami with some. Uh, with the, you know, with the nice marinated onions, you know, if, if you're Dominican, you know, you know, like, you feel me? Like, <laughs> you like know. you know, you know, like, <laughs> if you know, you know, you feel me? Some, some mango, you feel me? Like, oof, oof, yeah, that, that's fire right there. That's money right there. <laughs> I would say, like, for me, a burrito for some reason, kind of like a little bit to the spicy side would be good on that, too. A little bit of spice. A little bit of spice. <laughs> but um, but you know, I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. Uh, feel free to you know hit us up on social medias and uh, send us some more cases. Uh, we do read out messages, we do respond, and hopefully you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs> Peace Bye. out, everybody. Have a lovely day.